Welcome back to the nostalgic future. In this episode, I want to take a look at the GP2X F100. I'm also going to take a look at the previous models, a little bit of the company's history, and most importantly, the company's impact on portable emulators. I really do believe without the success of this line of emulators back in the day, I don't think we'd have so many different options nowadays. Even just the operating system, once you've hacked it, looks strikingly similar to a lot of the new handheld software. And this thing came out in 05. So let's set the scene. So this company, Game Park Holdings, it went under a few different names over the years, but their first handheld was called the GP32, and it released all the way back in 2001 to compete with the Game Boy Advance, in a way. And you could even get this to emulate the Game Boy Advance, so that was really crazy at the time. And as far as I know, it was the first Linux-based open operating system handheld you could buy as well. And it wasn't until a few years later in 2003 when we got the release of the Engage and also the Tapwave Zodiac. It was kind of a crazy year for that catch-all portable handheld market. It was finally blooming with the release of those two devices, even though we look at them as failures. It was really a time when that market was not only new, but companies were willing to do anything they felt like. Which brings us to our next point. It wasn't until a few years even after that, in 2005, when we got the Gizmondo. And we all know how that went down. As ambitious as that device really was, it ultimately just crashed and burned the hardest out of any of its competitors at the time. But 2005 also saw the release of this device here, the GP2X F100. Game Park's second try at a Linux open source portable handheld. And this time, they got almost everything right, except for what's plainly obvious by looking at it. We all know it probably should not have an analog stick. Because, I mean, look at the way mine wore after 11 or 12 years. It used to... It was, it was supposed to be just one solid stick, but mine came with some kind of aftermarket rubberized stick that, just like the texture of lots of things from back then, the rubber just disintegrated, so I'm just left with this wicked looking thing. But when this thing came out, there was really nothing like it. The PSP also came out in 2005, but it, it wouldn't be a few years until people started hacking that and running emulators on it. And you know, a similar story for the DS and the DS Lite. They would get flash carts and, you know, R4 cards and things like that, but, you know, a couple of years after they came out, and it was a lot more limited than this kind of situation. I mean, you could run custom firmware, custom front ends, there is a docking station on the bottom, and a dock that you could buy that would give it four USB ports on the front and an Ethernet on the back which was absolutely crazy and it totally did work with peripherals and USB thumb drives and stuff like that also. It was actually crazy. And you know, let's, let's take a look at it. There's that extension port on the bottom and I'm pretty sure this is just the same thing as like an old LG cell phone port. I'm pretty sure. Then we come around the side to the power switch which has to be flipped up or down. I do like that instead of a button. On top, we have really nice L and R switches. Also, an SD card slot, which I, of course, use nowadays a micro SD. 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And with a nice little cover that somehow hasn't melted. And then on the right side, we have the standard old USB port and a DC in, and it runs on two AA batteries, so I just keep four rechargeable AA batteries handy at all times, and she's ready to go. And you know, I also find it really crazy that in 2005 when this came out, the Game Boy Advance was still going pretty strong, and this was another device that could run its games at the same time you could go to the store and buy them brand new. I just find that to be such an interesting concept. That's not something you see nowadays. And you know, this thing was also overclockable. 
Stock out of the box, it had a dual core ARM CPU setup that was clocked at 200 megahertz. And a lot of them could clock over 250. And this one here sometimes can get to 300 or 310, which is just so fun to tinker with. Even now, it doesn't even get old. And it just feels great in the hands as well. It's got that Neo Geo pocket shape to it. It's really comfortable, even more comfortable than my, than my GBA. And the software is still so similar to what I had on my RG300. And it, it even plays most of the same consoles as it did. I mean, everything from the beginning of gaming up to PS1 and N64. It's not going to pull off N64 at all. And it'll do PS1 at half a dozen frames a second. But from that point older, every single console you can get working with some tinkering. And that's what I find so interesting, even after all these years. And they went on to have a successor model, the GP2X Wiz. And it was awesome in its own right. And then the final console they came out with was the Canu. And that one, I truly think, was well ahead of its time and deserves a video of its own. As always, I appreciate every one of you, especially the ones that stuck around this long. And I'll see you next time on... The Nostalgic Future.